In late 2020, the Ubuntu Reading Group, an initiative of the now defunct Kampala-based Center for African Cultural Excellence, published a collection of poetry titled No Roses from My Mouth, written by the Ugandan feminist activist and scholar Stella Nianzi. The poems in No Roses from My Mouth were composed from 2018 over a period of 18 months while Nianzi was incarcerated in Kampala's Luzira prison on charges of cyber harassment and offensive communication. Though Nianzi was by this time well known for her work as a feminist activist, amongst other things, she started the Pads for Girls 2007 movement to get sanitary products into secondary schools in Uganda. Uh, she started the Ugandan Women's Protest Working Group, and she organized the March 2018 Women's March Against Femicide in that country. The charges raised against her under the auspices of Uganda's Computer Misuse Act came not from her work as an activist or organizer, but rather for a poem that she wrote addressed to Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni, which she posted on her Facebook account. Written and published the day after Museveni's 74th birthday, in the poem Nyanzi writes, Yoweri, they say it was your birthday yesterday. How nauseatingly disgusting a day. I wish the acidic pus flooding Asteri, that's his mother, cursed vaginal canal had burnt up your unborn fetus, burnt you up as badly as you have corroded all morality and professionalism out of our public institutions in Uganda. The poem's quite a bit longer than this, but this is my favorite bit. Um, anyway, Nyanzi's case is one clear example of the ways in which political activism, literary creation, and knowledge production intersect, often with powerful and unanticipated results. As a self-styled organic intellectual, in Gramscian terms, Nyanzi's use of poetry as a medium for activist resistance is a natural expression of a larger agenda rooted in practices of engaged and direct action. Economic in its form and broad in its reach, poetry via Facebook for Nyanzi is both a platform for expression and a medium for affective transformation, a mode of writing whose very literariness its singularity as a form opens up pathways for radical thought, which can travel unfettered even when its author cannot. And I should say that today, Nyanzi is in exile. She is, I think, in Germany via Kenya. She is no longer able to live in the Uganda where she's done so much work. The editors of Nyanzi's collection echo the sentiment. In their introduction to the collection, they cite Audre Lorde, and her declaration that, quote, of all the art forms, poetry is the most economical. It is the one which is most secret, which requires the least physical labor, the least material, and the one which can be done between shifts in the hospital pantry, on the subway, on scraps of surplus paper. At the same time, this economy of form belies poetry's transformative potential as literary writing able to, in Ralph Waldo Emerson's terms, quote, abolish the past and refuse all history, opening utopian horizons and the possibilities of change. Critically, Nyanzi is a doctor of philosophy and medical anthropology by training and a political activist by profession, yet she deliberately identifies herself as a writer, in a 2021 tweet, Nyanzi shares the following poem. And again, I think it's quite interesting, though I can't get into the details of it, that she chooses to use social media as her platform for engagement. She publishes almost all of her work on either Facebook or Twitter and has gained large followings. So as she writes, as you can see, although I am in exile, I can still write as my contribution to the fight for freedom and liberation in Uganda. I am a writer. My name was made through writing. I am a freedom fighter. My fight for freedom is liberating. I write to fight against dictatorship. I fight for freedom to write what I like. When I write, I poke the leopard's anus with my might. 
When I fight, I use only nonviolent methods to fight. I am a writer in exile. I don't need to be home to write. I am a freedom fighter in exile. I don't need to be home to continue fighting. So I just think it's quite interesting that somebody who has done so much work in the larger sort of political and activist sphere still deliberately chooses to self-identify as a writer, as a literary writer, as a poet, as an essayist, first and foremost, as their primary weapon. So since the early 20th century, probably before that, the African continent has been a key site in which literary engagement has intertwined with the political and socialist activist movements that have marked its emergence as a zone of ostensibly independent nation-states in the post-colonial era. From the era of anti-colonial mobilization, led by figures such as poet, essayist, publisher, and future president of Senegal, Leopold Sédar Senghor, to the centrality of writers in liberationist struggles in Nigeria, South Africa, and elsewhere, an apparent link has emerged between literature, literary production, political mobilization, activism, and the various struggles to determine the imaginative horizons of political and social experience and claim-making on the continent. These function across spatial scales and registers of meaning. Some are highly localized, very specific in their linguistic bounds. Others are regional, others are pan-national, others are continental, others are diasporan. Extant work in African studies has noted the ways in which the creation of literary collectives, such as the Ibadan Nigeria-based Mbari Club, or Transition Magazine-based originally in Uganda, now housed at Harvard, or the Nigerian-based Black Orpheus, as well as university publications like the East African journals Darlight, Penpoints, and Busara, across the 50s, 60s, and 70s, enabled the constitution of public spaces and platforms in which writers and producers were able to engage in complex negotiations around the meaning of modernity, development, and citizenship on the African continent. A few brief examples illustrate the historical importance of literary activism to the region. I've mentioned before, but always can repeat, the foundational work of Leopold Sedar Senghor, first as a poet and as a literary activist, central to the development of the Negritude movement and the Pan-African student mobilization in mid-century Paris, later Senegal's first president the participation of prominent writers, thinkers, and members of the Mbari society, including Wole Shoinka, Chinua Ajebe, Alecha Amadi, and Christopher Okibo, in the protracted Nigerian Biafran War of 1967 to 1970, the harassment of Rajat Ngoi, founder of Transition Magazine, by the Ugandan government for perceived acts of sedition through the activities of the publication, and the imprisonment and, unfortunately, sometimes murder of writers from across the continent, including Ngugi Wa Thiongo, Kenyo Sarawiwa, and Chris Abani. As these examples demonstrate, the literary has long served as a key and sometimes feared site of socio-political mobilization, debate, and engagement on the African continent, with important material effects and implications both for governance and for activist movements operating in the region. And to give another quick example, this is one of my favorite examples, is um, one of Ngugi's novels, Matagiri, tells the story of a kind of freedom fighter who goes across the country fighting for justice against the government. The then government heard tell of this Matagiri and put out a bounty on his head. Well, he's a fictional character. There's no real Matagiri. But they didn't realize this, you know? So the literary is real. Literary activist collectives have played a crucial role in generating claims towards a situated mode of Afro-modernity inflected by the study against coloniality, which underwrote and continues to underwrite the struggle for political and true independence and produce pan-African networks of literary and cultural activism forged through textual, imaginative, social, and physical modes of space-making. These institutions, 
undergirded by their manipulation and reconfiguration of concepts of citizenship, civic engagement, and solidarity, thus form crucial outlets for forging a more expansive terrain of the political and enabling the opening of spaces in which the socio-political sediment could be imaginatively transmitted, often through highly specified codes of aesthetic practice. What's vital here to understand is that literary activism functions as a kind of production that, to paraphrase Hart and Negri in their work, Assembly, occurs, quote, ever more socially in networks of cooperation and interaction, while simultaneously resulting not just in commodities, but social relations and ultimately society itself. Literary activism thus functions through the commons of people and publics and the networks of practice that it produces. As such, it offers a crucial redress to models of the state, the market, and civil society as they are normally thought. It thus functions as the medium through which horizontal solidarities might emerge. At the same time, these horizontal solidarities remained entangled with vertical structures of power in many ways, including at the financial, operational, and infrastructural levels. I will return to this at the end of this talk. Equally, literary activism allows us to consider what we mean when we talk about the literary, what is the literary in a broad sense. If in a European or North American context, debates around literature and aesthetics have repeatedly returned to post-Enlightenment notions of art as disinterested, what is commonly thought of as art for art's sake, in the African context and a global South context more broadly, something rather different has obtained. Here, that is, the work of writers and cultural producers and their concerted interest in engagement with society through aesthetic forms demonstrates the ways in which art and culture more generally have always served as significant and constituent elements of social production and reproduction. A reflection of Raymond Williams' mid-century observation that all parts of the social unit interact, engage, and impact upon one another. So, as mentioned, scholarship on African literatures has always shown a deep preoccupation with the notion of the writer as engaged intellectual, with a significant role to play in the raising of national consciousness, constitution of the ostensibly post-colonial nation-state through anti-colonial struggle. For at least a century, the African continent has been a key site in which this has happened. And here I just wanted to show some of the covers of one of the most important and foundational literary magazines of the African continent transition. So this is one of their early covers from their original run, which was based in Uganda. These days, they're based in Harvard at the Hutchins Center under the leadership of Henry Louis Gates Jr. You can see there's a rather different aesthetic going on. They're a bit more of an academic journaly sort of thing now, but still. There's little consensus, however, on what the term literary activism means. How do we define the activism in literary activism? How do we define the literary in literary activism? For some, literary activism is a question of aesthetics. It's a formal issue, a championing of the platonic notion of the literary and the artistic. Amit Chowdhury, for instance, and perhaps most famously, develops an oppositional relation between what he terms market activism and literary activism, where the former is described as, quote, a species of activity that added a fresh and what soon became an indispensable dimension to the publishing of novels, and indeed how the novel would be thought of, and, quote, intimately connected to the discovery of new literatures, so that's market activism, the latter is more desultory. Very helpful definition. Under this view, market activism might be seen as concerned with questions of diversity, questions of access, questions of literature development, representation, and the development of new publics for new literatures. Literary activism, by contrast, concerns itself more with the introit and contested question of value and literary value. <laughs> 
Yet for other critics, working definitions would conceptualize literary activism as a mode of social production through the opening of spaces and platforms and constitution of networks and publics are paramount particularly the opening of platforms and publics which are rendered less visible on the global literary market, those which are based and centered on the African continent. So here we can think about the opening of spaces to make visible what Mora Dewon Adamonjobi calls citational publics, which exist and thrive and are crucial to the rendering of what we consider the literary and literary production but which we may not actually see outside of those specific localities, outside of those emplaced locations. As I, along with doctors Ruth Bush and Kate Wallace, wrote in a 2021 introduction to a special issue of Eastern African Literary and Cultural Studies, under this view, literary activism might be seen more aptly as a mode of knowledge production. As we wrote, Literary activism is, quote, an expression of agency that unfurls through a desire for a something else which is not essentialist in its aims and which leverages its own forms of momentum, end quote. Still more recent work explicitly delineates literary activism as a deliberate mode of political intervention, both through the production of literary writing under conditions of duress or through its contents, address, and modes of publicness. So we can return here to the example of Nyanzi, with which I opened this talk, who deliberately uses poetry, as she's stated repeatedly, as a way of engaging people. She says, the best way to reach the publics I want to reach is by writing poetry and then publishing it freely and open to all through social media. Um, we can also think of Ngugi Wathiango and his work, particularly in the 70s, where he switched from writing novels to doing community theater. Um, and he switched from English to Gikuyu in a concerted attempt to use the cultural as a way of opening up new avenues for publics to engage. We can think about Kenyol Sarawiwa, who was put to death under the Abacha regime, who used literary writing, both creative nonfiction and fiction, as a way of finding a platform for Ogoni activism, so working on behalf of his communities and the people of the Niger Delta, who, because of the oil richness of their region, were horrifically exploited and put under great duress by the government. So these various, if not contradictory, if not always contradictory, definitions imply literary activism does not function as a single concept or roadmap for literary engagement, but rather as a constellation of approaches to understanding cultural production. We can think of it, in a sense, as a kind of Wittgensteinian cluster concept, I suppose. So I'm focusing explicitly on a couple of case studies for the second half of this talk. But these case studies, I argue, have wider ramifications for the continent. They're not exceptional. They're just kind of things where I think we can see some of the patterns playing out. So I'm drawing on my own experiences as a researcher, a collaborator, a co-producer, and a friend who's been working with literary activists, including writers, editors, translators, readers, and other creatives, on the African continent for nearly a decade. It should go without saying, that my reflections are not and could not be comprehensive. Africa is not a country, and I am not a pan-continental expert. I just know what I've done. Um, at the same time, the case studies that I'm going to be going through strike me as representative of some of the larger patterns and tendencies which have marked literary activist work on the continent. Well before the term appeared in commonplace usage, the centrality of literary activism to the work of cultural production was made evident on the African continent. We can think then, besides the examples I've already mentioned, of things like the Nairobi-based Chem Chemi Collective. Uh, we can think about things such as the 1962 Conference of African Writers of English Expression, more commonly known as the Makarere Conference where Ngugi quite famously had his first meeting with the Chebe, leading to the publication of his first novel. We can think about the lesser known, but equally important, 1963 Fora Bay Conference of Teachers of Anglophone African Literature, held in Sierra Leone. 
we can think about the 1973 conference on African publishing held in Ife, Nigeria. We can think about the great Pan-African festivals held in the 60s and 70s in Dakar, Lagos, Kaduna, Algiers, and Kinshasa. And here you can just see, um, this is a publication by a collective I'll speak about shortly called Chimarenga, based in Cape Town. But they spent several years putting together, it's a massive book, I would have brought it, but it was too heavy to take on the train. Um, that's a catalog of the 1977 second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Cultures that was held in Nigeria. And it's a really fascinating document because they put together archival material with newly commissioned writing, with historical writing, and it's in about eight different languages, so nobody can read the whole thing, nothing's translated, it's fantastic. Um, difficult to get your hands on, but if you do, you should, it is very heavy. But we can also think about the role of school literary societies, which we know were now crucial to the fomenting of literary cultures. Uh, we can think about periodical cultures, we can think about newspapers, all these sorts of things have for a long time been crucial modes of literary production in the African continent. And quite often, I think, in the global north, we really only think about novels, you know, um, as they famously say, Achebe to Adichie. But those things wouldn't be possible without these other ecologies. There would be no Achebe without school literary societies, which is where he started writing. You know, all these sorts of things foment each other. So both historically and in its present shape, literary activism, I argue, enables a vision of social production which moves away from a polarity between the vertical and the horizontal, that is, between leadership and movements, through its broader engagement in institutional practices. So to give one example, and I've already mentioned them several times, uh, in the 1950s, the Ambari Club, for which the influential literary magazine Black Orpheus was published, was both a physical site for the meeting and collaboration of anti-colonial and radical writers, but also a symbolic location through which a series of aesthetic principles were developed and transmitted to wider publics. Crucially and critically, Black Orpheus did not limit itself simply to Nigerian writing. It published writing from the continent and its diasporas, and it was one of the first outfits in which Francophone African writing was translated into English. And I'll get back to the question of translation shortly. However, what's quite interesting about the Ambari Club is that it was funded by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which we know was an institution of the United States Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Despite these funding lines, the Mbari Club operated through a transformation of these modes of financial support into new institutions with specific and singular aims, not always of a piece with the goals and objectives of the former. And it's quite interesting to read, because it wasn't just the Mbari Club, it was, you know, Transition, Chim Chemi, all of these outfits that I've been mentioning in the mid-century were funded by the CIA as part of Cold War era soft power kinds of conflicts um, and um, races, I suppose. And what's interesting is to read the kind of variety of responses, because most of the people involved did not realize that the Congress for Cultural Freedom was actually the CIA. They thought they were just getting cultural funds, right? And they used this to do what they want. And there's a very interesting bifurcation where some now express great betrayal at the fact that this is where the money comes from, whereas others think, eh, I don't really care, I got the money, I got to do what I want, they never told me what to do. I think that's sort of an interesting tension. So both implicated within the vertical topographies of power during the Cold War, and radical in its fabrication of a space of commoning, the Mbari Club cannot be easily categorized as one or the other. And I think a lot of people want to say, well, you got CIA funding, so you're just stooges. And other people want to say, well, you're radical creatives and you resisted. But I don't think it's either of those. I think it's something a little bit messier in the middle. What I'm trying to say is we cannot relegate outfits like the Ambari Club into a neat binary in the realm of the air conditioner or the realm of the veranda, to use Emmanuel Terry's formulation. Um, so he talks about the two publics of the African continent, one being the realm of the air conditioner. This is official spaces like universities and institutions. The other being the veranda, where you just sit in the evening and you talk. And both are equally generative and important to the constitution of publics and social production. <laughs> 
So this is just one example of the complex historical interaction of institutions, their creation, their transformation, and their mutation. With the end of the Cold War, the institutional landscape against which literary activism operates has again shifted, this time sedimenting around the work of NGOs and donor agencies, including the Ford Foundation, who until 2016 supported Kenya's Kwani Trust, a very high-profile contemporary, though now defunct, literary network, um, and the Miles Moreland Foundation. These are just two examples. As these examples demonstrate, however, literary activism has always been riven by questions of soft power, questions of funding streams, and the larger role of Northern patrons. At the same time, the work of these foundations, institutions, and meetings is critical to the constitution of modern African literatures, in English in particular, but also in other languages. What this shows us is the role played by the literary as a site through which to constitute, negotiate, and contest the social. We can think here of anti-colonial thinkers such as Frantz Fanon and Amilcar Cabral, both of whom notably observed the importance of culture to the constitution of the post-independence nation. Far from acting as supplementary to real social production, Literature functions and functioned, as does culture more broadly, as a key avenue through which ideas about politics, society, morality, and liberation could be elaborated and, de and debated. At the same time, this was not saying that literature was instrumental, it was aesthetic. It was a deliberately aesthetic task. Early debates around African literature thus think about what the literary does as a register through which to create publics, what kinds of language should be used, what sorts of forms and aesthetics should be used, should literature be realist, should it be magical realist, should it be super realist, all of these sorts of things. Aesthetics were at the center of all of these sorts of questions. It's not just a case of literature as a way of talking to people. So I think there remain then broader questions to think about, about what literature can do and how it does it, which also need to be put in tandem with broader broader questions around extractivism in the way in which the work of Africa-based collectives are often appropriated and I would argue sometimes misused by institutions of the global north if we just think about these sorts of things. So I'm going to move now to finish to a couple of contemporary examples from my own work. In April of 2017, I organized a workshop in Cape Town, South Africa titled Personal Histories, Personal Archives, Alternative Print Cultures. This was part of a research network funded by the Arts and Humanity Research Council titled Small Magazines, Literary Networks, and Self-Fashioning in Africa and its Diasporas, which I co-led, co-directed for two years with my colleague, Dr. Christopher Oma. At the time, he was at the University of Cape Town. He is now at Duke University. The workshop was held in this beautiful space that you can see here, which is the now defunct Long Street premises of Chimarenga, a self-described project-based mutable object publication pan-African platform for editorial and curatorial work. Chimarenga is best known for their eponymous magazine, which published 16 issues between 2002 and 2011. They have expanded since to a broadsheet newspaper, they also have a pop-up radio station, internet-based. They have live events, they have parties, they have a new space. I think it's in the Woodstock neighborhood of Cape Town, but I'm not 100% sure. It's called the Chimarenga Factory. Uh, they do large-scale research projects, such as the Festac Reader that I showed, and they also run um, a publication called the African Cities Reader, which seeks to reimagine cities from an African perspective. So they do a lot. As part of our opening conversation with collaborators Billy Kahora, Bogani Kona, and Stacy Hardy, we asked, how has Chimarenga sought out and forged readerships and publics? In response to our question, Stacy Hardy argued that the idea of a quote target market was dangerous and arrogant, offering a powerful repudiation to dominant models within the global publishing industry and book trade. Chimarenga, Hardy explained, worked from a premise articulated by its founder, Ntoni Ajabe, that, quote, you don't have to find readers, readers will find you. 
Chimarenga's ethos, she continued, was one based on recognition, what she terms the recognition of being part of something, of encountering Chimarenga and clocking into belonging. For Hardy, readers weren't readers. They were Chimarenga people who would find the publication and on finding it, find something of themselves within it, be it through engagement with the magazine, attendance at live events or parties, or participation in the collective's online presence. For Hardy, this was a personal story, intricately linked with her own entry into the Chimaranda Collective, which was sparked by a chance encounter with the journal, the first issue of which you can see here, at Clark's Bookshop in Cape Town, early in her tenure as a new and unhappy Cape Town resident. This anecdote gestures to something much more complex than may first make itself evident. As Hardy's response evokes, to be a Chimarenga person is to enter into a kind of mutual recognition based on a shared ethos, one spread both through the actual transmission of the print magazine, but extending far beyond, encompassing multiple modalities and forms, both physical, digital, and textual. And yet, while Chimarenga's editorial agenda is driven by what the editors want to read, and a firm belief that people are, quote, interested in brilliant wild thinking, as part of the same conversation in 2017, Hardy talked about Chim Chimarenga's shift from its flagship journal to its current incarnation, The Chronic, a quarterly broadsheet in 2013, built both out of a network of friendship, but driven primarily by a need to reach more people. So the idea was, well, the form of the literary journal doesn't really reach people, but a broadsheet reaches people a lot more, because you, know, you can kind of throw it into shops, you can kind of leave it on a bus bench, you can take apart all the different sections, these sorts of things. So perhaps what best encapsulates this multifaceted positioning is their tagline, which I don't know if you can see it, because unfortunately, Black on red on black isn't very easy to look at, but Chimarenga's tagline is taken from the Fela Kuti lyric, who no no go no. So my own work with literary activists began as a serendipitous series of meetings in 2016, when I was invited to the now defunct Kampala-based Rightivism Festival. I was invited in order to co-convene the first arts managers and literary entrepreneurs workshop, which the next year changed its name to arts managers and literary activists. And we can think a bit about this shift from entrepreneurship to activism. There's a lot to say. Um, over the course of four intense days, I worked with Dr. Kate Wallace and Dr. Kate, uh, Professor Ruth Bush with the necessary aid of Professor Grace Musilla, who was instrumental in developing the workshop, but unfortunately was unable to get a visa to attend, tale as old as time. Uh, we worked with 30-odd aspiring literary activists from around 16 African countries. During this time, our sessions focused on a range of questions around how to develop literary infrastructure, such as magazines, networks, translation platforms, book distribution initiatives, as well as more theoretical questions around what it means to be a literary activist. On the back of this particular workshop, I entered into a number of long-standing collaborators, uh, collaborations rather, with literary producers based on the African continent. So I'm going to now, for the end of the talk, shift to focus on one of the ones that has become the most central to my work. And this is a collaboration with the Cameroon-based network, Bakwa. Following my initial meeting, at the 2016 Rightivism Festival with Zakashu McVeebin, founding editor of Bakwa, a literary network based primarily in Yaoundé, Cameroon, but really spanning all over the place, I entered into what has been a very happy, many years long collaboration. Our most notable work to date has been the Bakwa Bristol Literary Translation Project, which was initiated in 2018 under funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Cameroon has a unique history in terms of its colonial and post-colonial past, and this informs the ways in which Bakwa shapes its literary aesthetic. In its initial offering, Bakwa was founded in 2011 as a digital magazine. Zakashu McVeebin, its founder, notes that he initially got the spark to start Bakwa to, quote, fill a lacuna and respond to the absence of spaces in Cameroon where writers, particularly Anglophone writers and critics, could publish both creative and critical work. Since its original conception as a digital literary magazine, Bakwa has grown into a multimedia collective, working variously 
in the publication or production of podcasts as a publishing house, as a pop-up library, producing live literary events, and more. At the time of its founding, McVeeben, himself a writer, had little experience with editorial work nor digital publishing. With the institution of Bakwa Books in 2020, the collective's publishing house, Bakwa's work has increasingly turned to the question of language and its specific ramifications in the Cameroonian context. Language use and indeed the language of literary production have particular valences in the country for reasons which link directly to its complex history of colonial rule. So from the time of independence to the present day, Cameroon has been beset by violent conflict between its francophone government and anglophone separatist movements calling for the creation of an independent nation state, which they would like to have called Ambazonia or Ambaland. And you can see it's very difficult. I know the colors here aren't the best, but you can see all the kind of bluish bits. So that's eight of Cameroon's 10 regions are francophone. These two kind of pinkish ones are anglophone. And then this bit here is technically Nigeria, but was once part of anglophone Cameroon. So once the German colony of Cameroon, after the end of World War I, the country became a UN trust territory administered under both British and French mandates. So the majority bit was under a French mandate, the kind of pinky bit was under a British mandate. So you can kind of imagine what this means, right? The bit administered by France, though a trusteeship, a trust territory, was administered under similar lines to Afrique Occidentale Française or Afrique Equatoriale Française. The pinky bit, the anglophone bit, that was administered by the British was administered along the same lines as Nigeria. So essentially it's the same thing as Nigeria. So what happened then is that you had a bifurcated system in which in one country there were two vastly different ways of organizing politics, education, economics, so on and so forth. So really, really differential lines. Critically, these were not symmetrical lines. They were asymmetrical in terms of resource and wealth distribution. The Anglophone areas, that is to say, were relatively neglected in terms of the distribution of national resource compared to the Francophone areas. This was exacerbated by the continual rule of Francophone governments since the the independence of La République du Cameroon in 1960. A fun fact about Cameroon, they're only on their second president ever. There's only been two, um, and they're both francophone. In 1961, the country held a plebiscite determining the fate of the British Cameroons. There was a great deal of colonial interference, as you might imagine, and this resulted in the unification of the northern Cameroons with Nigeria, so the bit that I was sort of jumping to try to point out, uh, and the southern Cameroons were unified with the French Republic of Cameroons. This, in turn, sparked conflict between federalists, separatists, and unionists, which has continued ever since. So Cameroon now has two official languages, English and French. Alongside over 250 African languages, including Fang, Iwondo, and Bamun, French is the main language in eight of Cameroon's 10 regions. A 2005 census notes that 57.6% of the population speaks French, versus 25.2% of the population who describe themselves as English-speaking. Despite the institution of the National Commission for the Promotion of Bilingualism and Multiculturalism in 2017, moreover, very few Cameroonians define themselves as bilingual in the sense of fluency in both English and French. Of course, most people are bilingual in the sense of a European language and multiple native languages. More importantly, Anglophone and Francophone are less linguistic identities than they are political identities. So you will meet somebody, and I have many friends and collaborators I've worked with who've lived their whole life in, say, French-speaking Yaoundé and are more fluent in French than English, but they'll say, I'm not Francophone, I'm Anglophone, because their family's from, you know, the Northwest or something. It's a political identity more so than anything else. This can be kind of captured in a popular saying, which is Cameroon is bilingual, but not Cameroonians. <laughs> 
a consequence of the country's policy of official bilingualism, which was explained by former president, their first president, Ahijo, as, quote, by bilingualism, we mean the practical usage of our two official languages, English and French, throughout the national territory. So this context is important for understanding Bakwa's current work and especially the importance of transla translation and language to their mission. As a deliberately Cameroon-centered project, Bakwa over recent years has sought to engage in the production of wider networks and infrastructures, not only around writing, but around literary translation and editing as a means of affecting change at the level of the social. This returns us to my work with them. Following our award of AHRC funding in 2018, I worked with Zakashu McVeeben, Georgina Collins, and Ruth Bush to design a series of workshops around creative writing and translation under the highly imaginative title, Creative Writing and Translation for Peace. Really spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, in 2019, we ran two creative writing workshops simultaneously. One was in French, the other was in English. Uh, the French one was facilitated by Edwige Droll, the English by Billy Cahora. After a period of mentorship following the workshops, we did a follow-up workshop for emerging literary translators, facilitated by Ross Schwartz, Edmi Stroh, and Georgina Collins. These emerging translators were then mentored to work to translate the stories from the creative writing workshops from English to French and vice versa, resulting in the production of a bilingual anthology published by Bakwa Books, Your Feet Will Lead You Where Your Heart Is, or Le Crapuscule des Amseurs. At the heart of the project was, on the one hand, a distinctly political aim to attempt in the context of the Anglophone crisis to develop lines of communication, empathy, and bridge building between Anglophone and Francophone Cameroonian experiences. And one thing that I should make clear is that Cameroon also has a bifurcated educational system, so you either do um, Frank, French school, which is like the French baccalaureate, or you do your Anglophone school, which is like GCSEs, A-levels, that sort of thing. They have a different name for it, but they're very, very, very different. And in essence, what that means is that depending on your political identity as Anglophone or Francophone, you're getting a different education. You're getting a different story of what the country is and what it means and who tells it. And I find that quite fascinating. There are now some bilingual, quote unquote, schools, but from what I understand, they're not actually bilingual again. You kind of have to choose. And again, that impacts what university you go to, it impacts what you do, it impacts all sorts of things. It's very, very fascinating, but also very sad. So one participant in our workshops explained to us that their interest in participating was something they felt was fundamental due to the fact that without knowing each other's stories, how can communities come to know one another? At the same time, the, the project wasn't explicitly political, by which I mean participants, including writers and translators, weren't limited in topics. We weren't like, write about the Anglophone crisis. We were like, write what you want, write a great story. Um, they weren't limited in terms of the aims and purviews of their creative participation. Like all of Bakwa's projects, the primary aim was aesthetic, to nurture and support a radical aesthetics and creative thinking through a focus on craft. Yet as the project unfolded, it became clear that this is itself political. So if the literary scene in Cameroon has been mediated in large parts by the country's post-colonial politics and colonial politics, and one thing that's quite notable is that there's very little translation between Francophone and Anglophone Cameroonian writing. Even a writer of the stature of Mangu Bati, not very few of his books are actually translated. It's really shocking when you think about it. It's of no little consequence that Bakwa's projects have attempted to engage and shape publics and networks of practice differently. So you can think, for example, about the 2017 Short Story Prize that they run, which worked across languages, including a judging panel made up entirely of bilingual readers. Or we can think about things like the Bakwa Reading Series, of which you can see some pictures of one of the edition here, which operates not through official bilingualism, but through an ethos that everyone in the room is part of a community, and everyone can choose what language they prefer to speak in. Um, if you want to speak English, you speak English. If you want to speak French, you speak French. There's no official translation or interpretation. If you don't understand, you can ask a friend sitting next to you, but the idea is everyone can understand everyone because everyone's part of this community. And this was just a tweet after the third edition of the reading series by the Cameroonian writer and activist Florian Ngimis, in which he says, it was a super moment. I loved the homogeneity between quote-unquote francophones and quote-unquote anglophones. It was a young, 
audience, and everyone was perfectly bilingual, reaching across the cleavage that's killing our country. So that was kind of cool. So I want to link this back to the ideas found in Stacey Hardy's comments, which I mentioned earlier, especially the idea of literary activist work occurring through networks of friendship and intimacy, built upon mutual recognition, shared ethics, and shared aesthetics. I was struck, for instance, by comments made by Zakakuru McVeeben in 2019 at a one-day conference on literary translation. In a presentation on Bakwa, McVeeben made the point that in order to live out shared aesthetics and ethics, we might need to think about sustainability differently. Bakwa's own model, at present, for instance, particularly with Bakwa books, is to operate at a loss to make the books affordable. Their books generally sell for around 2,000 to 3,000 CFA, which is really cheap. If you go to a regular bookshop and get you know, something published at Gallimard, it might be 25,000. 2,000, 3,000 is essentially nothing. McVeeven has argued that, of course, Bakwa could look at making a short-term profit, but they would likely end up folding in two or three years. Instead, the aim is to generate an audience and a public who are invested in the Bakwa project, who think of themselves as Bakwa people. And then, thinking about profitability as something that might emerge across time. This, however, returns us to the problem of funding. One irrefutable fact is that the work that we have been doing together would not have been possible without the financial support of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and our follow-up activities and research would not be possible without the income generated from the European Research Council, from whom I have a starting grant. And indeed, even the names of the projects we've done speak to the imperative to address the Western funder in a way that is going to make you sellable. I would characterize my work with Bakwa as founded predominantly on friendship and shared ideals, but I'm not naive. It remains the case that this work depends on my participation as a UK-based academic who has access to the aforementioned funding schemes. It's further through that, true that structures and institutions that are Africa-based and Africa-centered remain a struggle, particularly access to high-quality, affordable printing and distribution facilities. So, for example, if you're trying to send a bunch of books from Lagos, Nigeria to Nairobi, Kenya, the cheapest way to do it is via London. While this is happily in the process of changing, with publishers such as the Ivorian Nimba Press dedicated to local editing and printing, it remains a significant area of struggle. At the same time, it would be short-sighted to dismiss literary activist work as forever oppressed by the processes of NGOization or derealization. One refrain that's repeated itself across my many interviews, not just in Cameroon, but in Cote d'Ivoire, in Nigeria, in Kenya, elsewhere, is the need to take and use the resources at hand, but use them for one's own aims and goals. So just to kind of wrap up, you know, you can think about some examples of what people are doing to do this. So um, the Ivorian literary activist Edvige Dro, for instance, runs Bibliothèque 1949. It is a library dedicated to black women's writing from around the world in the popular quarter of Yopougon and Abidjan. And one of the things she's done is started a restaurant. So she gets some funding from different mentoring projects and workshops, but the restaurant is what keeps the library running. The tagline, in fact, is 1949, the restaurant where we read, the library where we eat, uh, and their affordable pricing in a highly populated quarter of the city means there's a lot of foot traffic, there's a lot of people coming in. There is myriad other examples of people trying to think differently and out of the box of ways to fund themselves and the things they do. Um, and so I would just say by way of conclusion that if literary activism, as I've described it, is sometimes ambiguous and entangled in various networks and structures which cross spatial, spatial kind of scales, which cross different sorts of institutional and logistical barriers and gaps, it's also a space where individuals and collectives retain a sense of agency creating their own networks and platforms, which, while not always visible to publics in the global north, remain essential to the development of literary cultures and the construction and constitution of the social more broadly. This open spaces through which the very boundaries of the literary and the political can be opened to new horizons based on radical collaborations and a rejection of simple binaries or received knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>
Professor Christian, thank you. That was a really rich, really interesting talk. I thought what was um, particularly interesting, this idea of how literary activism works on so many different levels. I mean, we're very used to it in that quite literal mm -hmm. level of literary act activism, or that must mean more diversity in publishing or, or you know, reaching new demographics. And this idea that Africa, being a very pluralistic space mm -hmm. historically and contemporarily, um, actually implants this new idea of literary activism as a struggle for social space, a struggle mm -hmm. for political space, cultural space. I thought that was all really interesting ideas. We've got some great questions in a few minutes um, mm -hmm. to, to have a go at them. So uh, Cyrus was wondering if you could speak a bit more about the cultures that exist uh, around some of these contemporary um, mm -hmm. sort of African writers. Uh, for example, are they, are they actually widely read at home, like, um, or within their, or is it more localized within their own communities? Um, I think it depends. You can't give a sort of blanket answer to that. There are some, so for example, Florian Gimbis, he's very widely known, um, but primarily through his blogging. He's very big on social media. So there'll be people on social media who are quite widely known, who people sort of know about. Uh, Stella Nyanzi, who I opened the talk with, is quite widely read and known, not just in Uganda, but in Kenya and sort of globally. Um, that being said, there's not a huge amount of readership across linguistic communities because there's not a huge amount of translation that goes on. Um, even a writer such as Emily Boom, who is one of the most famous contemporary Cameroonian writers, has only recently started being translated into English. Prior to that, an English speaker wouldn't be able to read her stuff because it was published by Gallimard in French in Paris. So there are these kind of logistical questions. Um, there's also the larger question of literacy. And, you know, we know quite a few of my interlocutors, for example, have said, well, my mom can never read this because she's not literate enough in English. Um, but I kind of push back against this question of readership because we know for a fact that in this country, literary fiction is on the decline. Not that many people read literature anymore in terms of like the big novels and these sorts of things. And I always think when people talk about like, well, Africans don't read, Indians don't read, you know, Latin Americans don't read, well, yeah, British people don't read either. Why is it such a problem when it's the global south? You know, and so I think we need to think about that because we know from looking at like BIC indexes, we know from looking at Nielsen book scan, we know readerships are on the decline everywhere. So I think we need to think about why do we moralize on certain geographies as opposed to others. Uh, absolutely, and one of the points you made earlier as well was that we've got to take a, have a bit more of a broader imagination with these different forms of literary production, especially online um, and in the sort of social media spaces, and you know maybe not draw quite so stark a line between oral and written literatures. That's a very kind of absolutely. colonial imposition. Absolutely, thing and to do. I'm not a digital utopian by any means, but I also think you know, like the dismissal of digital platforms or the dismissal of audiobooks. Well, those are still legitimate forms of reading. Listening to an audiobook is still reading, in my opinion. Uh, there's a, uh, this leads on nicely to another question. Were the French and English versions of the Bakwa anthology in one volume or two, and what was the distribution method and uptake across the two distinct regions? It was one volume. I should have brought a copy, actually, because the way that we did it is like if you hold it one way, it was in English, but then if you flip it, it was in French. So it was kind of half and half, and you could sort of just go between them the way you wanted to. Um, the question of distribution is quite interesting, and it goes back to some of the infrastructure barriers that we face. Um, it's fairly well known that affordable, high-quality printing is almost impossible in West Africa at the moment. There simply do not exist the infrastructure. You can get high-quality printing, but it's really expensive, and you can get affordable printing, but it's terrible quality. Um, so actually, the anthology, as well as a number of Bakwa's publications, most of them have been published in the UK, sent to my house, and then I bring them with me to Cameroon when I go, um, which is a ridiculous situation to be in, but it's the most affordable way to do it. Um, the distribution has been through local bookshops, um, events, festivals, different book festivals in Europe, North America, and on the African continent, as well as pop-up events and launches. Uh, the distribution is pretty decent. I think, I think, you know, like at least maybe, I don't want to say the number because I might be wrong, but I feel like it's north of a thousand 
copies have been sold. And in general, with booksellers, if you sold more than 800 copies of literary fiction, you're doing pretty well. So it's, it's, it was a good number. It had good traction. But again, it was priced very competitively, very competitively, which I think is really important. Hi, um, my name is Melody. Thank you so much for such an engaging and enlightening talk. I had a question, and I think it was from one of the lines of the poem that you shared. Mm -hmm. I think I wrote it down. It was, I think she said, sorry, one moment. I don't need to be home to continue fighting. Mm -hmm. um, I think someone said of the Argentine writer Julio Cortazar, mm -hmm. he was displaced. And so, therefore, the writing he would write about Argentina was coming from this place of it's a mythical, nostalgic mm. space as opposed to mm. where he lives. Mm. I'm really curious, do you feel like displacement affects, like, not the validity, but just the nature mm -hmm. of literary activism when mm. the writer has been displaced mm -hmm. either by mm -hmm. force mm -hmm. or sometimes by choice? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, of course, displacement is going to change one's perception, positionality is central, right? I mean, everything's sort of mediated by your own position, both sort of metaphysically, epistemologically, but also physically. But I think in, in the case of Nyanzi, you know, having looked at kind of her work for a while, it's not actually all that different. I don't think that there's been a huge difference. I think, if anything, she's able to be more politically engaged from the safety of Germany than when she was constantly a threat of being imprisoned, which she was and numerous times for a very long time. And I personally wouldn't like to be in a Ugandan prison. It's not something I want to do. Um, but I think, of course, it does impact things. And I think it goes one of two ways. And I think one of it is, as you say, the sort of nostalgic, romantic sort of vision of an imagined homeland to use Salman Rushdie's term, that doesn't exist and never did. But I think the other can be the capacity to be more engaged due to the fact that you're no longer in physical threat, your children aren't in threat, your partner is not in threat, you're not worried about someone coming and assassinating you, so you can engage more, more deeply. Um, and I think that, again, I don't want to suggest that that's a binary polarity. I think it's probably a sort of messy confluence of the two. Um, what are the potential backlash, sort of backlashes that activists face? Um, you mentioned one at the beginning of the talk. Have you come across many others? I mean, is, is this mm. an inherently dangerous thing to be doing? I mean, I wouldn't say it's inherently dangerous, but... You know, I know more than one person who's been threatened or who's had a stint in prison or who's been afraid or who has left. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's not a case... We always joke, me and many of my collaborators, that in a sense, being a literary activist is the safest form of activism because we all know that the governments aren't reading literature. <laughs> But there is a real and present danger. There are people who get imprisoned and there are people who have to go into exile. So, you know, I think to an extent there is a backlash, but I think to an extent that's also where the sort of medium of the aesthetic and the literary come into play because it is a way that you can interact and reach a lot of people through kind of literary cultures, but also sort of fly under the radar. Yeah, mm. brilliant. Okay, please join me in giving a huge round of appreciation to our speaker, <laughs> Professor Krishnan. Thank you.